Let's begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we confess that you are the creator of all things. You have given us life. You have given us the ability to serve you. And yet we have broken your covenant. We have despised the gifts. And yet, Father, we also confess that you have not left us destitute, but have sent your Son to die for our sins and to grant us new transfigured life in your kingdom. Father, we come this week to study your kingdom. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be among us in great measure to enable us better to understand the principles of the kingdom. Father, we confess that there is a great deal that we don't know. There is a great deal that we need to know in a time such as ours. We ask that you would give us that wisdom and understanding. We pray in the name of Christ our King. Amen. My task is in three lectures to basically talk about some keys to the interpretation of prophecy. Uh, keys and key ideas. And that's an awful lot to talk about in three two and a half hour lectures. But we'll uh, have to do the best we can. And these lectures are of necessity going to be more suggestive than anything else. But I think that if I can introduce you to a realm of ideas and principles and things to think about and chew on, and also direct you to good books that you can read to fill it out, I'll have done my job. I'd like to uh, call your attention to one of the interesting prophecies that the Bible has in it. It's in Genesis chapter... Uh, excuse me. Genesis chapter 15, verse 5. God took Abraham outside, we read, and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to, the, to him, So shall your seed be. I think uh, our normal way of interpreting that, and not necessarily anything wrong with it, is to assume that Abraham went out and, and started up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and of course instantly realized it's impossible to add up the number of stars. Yet some scholars tell us, and, and this is a, a disputable point, but some scholars tell us that that's not actually the meaning of the Hebrew phraseology there. It's rather to count down the stars, to look at the patterns that are laid out in the heavens. And these patterns would reveal uh, the nature of the seed, singular. Because it does say, so shall your seed, singular, be. And that, of course, is picked up by Paul in Galatians, where he refers to seed and not to seeds. Now, recently, scholars in Europe have come up with a very interesting way of uh, interpreting this. And we have a whole essay for it for sale downstairs, and we want you to buy it so that we'll have fewer to inventory. But when Abraham looked at the heavens, he saw planets, moons, and other things working in terms of various cycles. In fact, when he looked at the heavens and the sky, he was seeing a picture of the highest heaven where God's throne is. Because Genesis chapter 1, verse 8 says, God called the firmament heaven. That is, the firmament which separates the waters from the waters is called heaven. But in Genesis chapter 1, we see that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was, without formless, was formless and void. In other words, there's the third heaven, we say, that God made on the first day, and then within our world, God creates an image or picture of that heaven, which is the firmament or sky. And the things that are in the sky are pictures or reminders of the ultimate realities which are right at the throne of God himself. They're images or symbols that God has put in the world to reveal truth. What, did, uh, what are some of the things Abram might have seen? Well... I'm only going to talk about one of them. This is a curiosity, but it's a curiosity that scholars are beginning to take more and more seriously. Abram could look back at Genesis chapter 5, and he could find out that if he just took selectively some of the numbers there, Adam lived 930 years, Jared lived 962 years, 
and Enoch lived, curiously enough, 365 years, that, came to, that comes to a total of 2,257 years, which is, coincidentally, the sum of the synodical periods of the five planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. If you take the number of days it takes for a planet to go across the sky with its backtracking and come back to the same place in the sky, that's a synodical period. We're not talking about how long it takes for a planet to go around the sun. We're talking about how long it takes for it to go across the sky and come back to the same place in the sky. And of the five, those five major planets, that's the sum. Now, he could also look at Venus, which has a synodical period of 584 days, and Saturn, which has a synodical period of 378 days, and that adds up to 962, which is the number of years Jared lived. And if you take Jupiter, which is 399 days, Saturn 378, da 378 days, that adds up to 777, which is Lamech. Now, that's interesting. Then this is the number of years Lamech lived. That's interesting. Now, the problem is that I don't have a computer that I can program in such a way as to see how much of this could be coincidence. But it begins to stretch your imagination when you find this happening over and over again in the Bible. God said to Abram, So will your seed be. It will be like the stars of the heavens. Now, Gordon Wenham in his commentary on Numbers points out that when Israel came out of Egypt, they were organized by tribes around the tabernacle. And then there are census figures. Each tribe has so many tens of thousands in it. If you take the last two number zeros off those numbers, you get the same kind of thing. In Numbers chapter 2, Benjamin totaled 35,400 people. Take the two zeros off and you get 354, which is a lunar year. The number 949 occurs several times, and these are just a few of many phenomena in this passage. Issachar and Ephraim add up to 949. Manasseh and Dan together add up to 949. Naphtali and Asher add up to 949. And the synodical period of the sun, 365 days for the sun to go around, and 584 for Venus comes to 949. Now these are just a few of the statistics that are there. We have an essay by Barnouin downstairs where he goes into this in a great deal of detail. Now, you don't burn at the stake for that. But on the other hand, if God designed the world and is in absolute and complete and total control of every factor in it, and if God repeatedly says in the Bible that men are like stars and that the church is like a new heavens, a new organization, then perhaps there's some truth to it, especially when you begin to look at it and the numbers keep adding up the right way over and over again. Now, we don't ordinarily think about stuff like that. And there are reasons why we as Western American Christians tend not to think about that. And that's why in these lectures we can only be suggestive. And what I've given you is a suggestion. It's not an absolute. And yet it's a suggestion we believe is worth tracking. I want to make three introductory remarks about the interpretation of prophecy. Three introductory remarks. All of this has been introduction to the introduction. First of all, all the Bible is prophecy. All the Bible is prophecy. Because there's a broad and a narrow sense to prophecy. In the broad sense, prophecy is a general teaching about the purpose of history. That is the way we use the word prophecy normally. There are other meanings for the term. But in the broad sense, prophecy is a general teaching about the purpose of history. But then the word prophecy has a particular meaning, and that is its particular prediction of events. Some events that God predicts don't come true. For instance, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. God said it, and it didn't come true. Because people repented. But that's a particular kind of a prophecy, a particular pr prediction of an event. So there's prophecy in the broad sense and prophecy in the narrow sense. And everything in the Bible is prophecy in the broad sense. Everything in the Bible has to do with God's general purposes of history. The Bible starts in the garden. It ends with the city. That's development. 
You start with trees, you cut the trees down, you build them into a house. That's development. That's a philosophy of history. Solomon's temple, we're told in 1 Kings chapter 7, Solomon's house that he lived in, his palace, was built of the forest of Lebanon. See, the trees are cut down and made into a house. So there's development. And all the Bible gives us a philosophy of history, and that's prophecy in one sense, in the broad sense. Second, talking about how the Bible, all the Bible is prophecy, is that we cannot successfully isolate principles that apply only to predictive prophecy and not to other things. For instance, the law that we find is full of symbolism. I think we tend to think, uh, the, the normal way to think is, well, there's symbolism in prophecy. And, but when we get to the law, well, there's no symbolism there. That's clear and plain and straightforward and doctrinal. But prophecy, that's full of symbolism. Yet when you look at the law, you find a bunch of symbolism. Deuteronomy 25, verse 4 is an example. You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. Now that scholars tell us that um, if you don't muzzle the ox while he's threshing, he won't thresh. He'll just stop and eat. So why would God give them a command to do something that won't work? Well, that's because this is not quite law. It's Torah or wisdom. It means that when the ox is finished threshing, you let him eat. But actually, while he's threshing, you wouldn't, you wouldn't just let him eat while he threshes, or he wouldn't get anything done. Now, any Jew... Suppose, scholars, I don't know anything about oxen seed. But scholars, the guys I read, they all say any Jew would have known you can't quite do what this law says. It wouldn't work. So he is impelled to look for wider, deeper meanings. And of course, St. Paul says that means pay the preacher. But in context, that's not the actual meaning either. It says... That's the introductory law, which goes on to say, when brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as a wife and perform the duty of a levier or husband's brother to her. That's a law you're familiar with. I die, I don't have any children, so my brother takes my wife and raises up. And the first child that's born is, carries on my inheritance in my name. And so my brother manages my estate uh, for 20 years until the son who is officially has my name, is actually his physically, but officially mine, until that son grows up and inherits the property. Now the question is going to come during those 20 years while the uh, brother is administering the property for his dead brother, what happens to the crops? Can he eat of the crops that are grown? Or do they all have to be sold and all the money put in trust? Well, the law answers it. While the ox is treading out the corn, you don't muzzle him. So while the brother is doing the, performing the duties of a levier, he is entitled to eat of the produce of the land until such time as a child is old enough to inherit and then he loses it. Now, we have to go a long way and think quite a bit. And if that's obscure to you, well, you'll have to keep thinking about it because the whole levirate law is obscure for one thing. Why would Paul apply that to preachers in the church? Are, are the pastors in the church, are they levirs for Jesus Christ who has gone to heaven? Are we holding the church in trust for him? Is that the idea? It's complicated. My only point is not to settle all issues here but to point out that the principles of prophecy in the broad sense and the principles of interpreting prophecy in the narrow sense are pretty much the same. Prophetic literature in the Bible, Ezekiel and Daniel and Revelation, they're not completely different from the rest of the Bible. They don't have strange and peculiar rules that apply to them alone. All the Bible is prophecy, either in a broad or narrow sense, and the same principles apply throughout. So. Actually, what we're going to be considering here are general principles of interpretation, 
with a special focus on how these apply to prophecy in the narrower sense, that is, to predictive prophecy, to these prophecies that are couched in all kinds of symbolic language, like in Ezekiel and Daniel, Zechariah, Zephaniah, and those other obscure books. Now, I can't say it all in three lectures, and so I'm going to talk about three things today, tomorrow, and Friday. And that is, we're going to try to learn how to read architecturally. We're going to examine briefly the spatial symbolic system that the Bible has. We're going to try to learn to read eschatologically, that is, become aware of covenant history and its structure, the structure of time, structure of space, the structure of time, and finally, read liturgically, that is, the structure of worship, because worship is central in the kingdom. The day of the Lord, or Lord's day, is the beginning and end of history. When God called Israel out of Egypt, it wasn't first and foremost to start a theocracy. First and foremost, it was go three days into the wilderness to worship me. Then we'll talk about Bill and the theocracy. So, we need to learn to read architecturally, eschatologically, and liturgically. To start with, though, we need to read theologically. And so, still under introductory remarks, I want to talk briefly about reading theologically. And then we're going to talk about reading architecturally. Reading the Bible theologically, by that I mean three things. Three things. And this is a way of getting at some problems. First of all, since interpreting prophecy involves symbolism, where are the checks and balances? Now, if, if you've ever tried to deal with symbolism, you come right away with this. Where are the checks and balances in symbolism? Well, I think that, you know, that fish there means Jesus Christ. Because in the early church, you know, uh, I was supposed to be given some pens to draw with, and I wasn't, so there you are. In the early church, a fish sign... That, uh, that's a reference to Jesus Christ. Well, is that what it means in the Bible when you see fish? How about the five loaves and two fish? Augustine says the five loaves are the five books of Moses, and the two fish are the Old and New Covenants. Does that strike you immediately as... Uh, I mean, does that, you, do you immediately respond to that and say, yeah, that's obvious symbolism? Jesus feeds the 5,000 to five loaves. He's given them the five books of Moses, symbolically. And the two fish, he's given them the Old and New Covenant. Now, when you begin to look at Augustine's arguments, they begin to make a little bit more sense, although I'm not persuaded. Nor am I almost persuaded. What kind of checks and balances, though, can we have on, on symbolism? Well, reading theologically is one of the best ways, and by that I mean systematic theology and historical theology give us checks and balances. You can look at the symbolism of the Bible, and you can ignore systematic theology, and you can ignore the history of dogma in the church, and you can come up with all kinds of weird things. You can come up with stuff that contradicts everything in the faith by just taking a symbolic image in the Bible and running way off into space with it somewhere. So, reading theologically forms a check on speculative approaches to symbolism, speculation outside the Bible. That's the first thing I mean by reading theologically. Good. And I want to illustrate that. Not only uh, does... Historical theology as a history of ideas help us, but so does historic iconography. If I said to you, let's just take an example. Um, when Jesus Christ hangs on the cross, and there's blood on each of his hands, and there's blood on his feet, and there's blood on his head, that's a symbol of the gospel die, of Christ dying for the sins of the entire world. And here's why. In the Garden of Eden, you have four rivers that flow out, and those four rivers flow out to the four corners of the earth. The four corners of the earth are just like the four corners of the altar. 
And on the altar there are four horns at each of the corners, and every time a lamb was sacrificed, blood was put on the four corners of the altar to signify that the blood of the lamb covers for the sins of the entire altar, which is a symbol for the world, so the sins of the entire world. And so Jesus Christ on the cross, the blood at the four extremities of the cross corresponds to the blood on the four corners of the altar, and it's a symbol for Christ's death for the entire world. Now, does that immediately strike you as weird and far out? Okay, weird and far out. And yet, if we knew the history of Christian iconography, that wouldn't be strange, because this picture here is standard. For 2,000, well, not for 2,000, because we're strangers to it. But for, let's say, the first 1,600 years of the church history, this is a standard picture of the Garden of Eden. Standard. A fountain in the middle and four rivers going out. And it's standard and understood that an altar with four corners, with the four horns, is made of earth because it represents the earth, and you have the same idea.